African Commission on Human Rights, I want to issue a warm welcome to everyone here and to the beginning of the 149th session of the Commission. This hearing this morning has been granted at the instance of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights itself, which has closely followed the situation of persons held at the Guantanamo Bay facility since the opening of the facility. I'm joined this morning at the table um, by Commissioner Rose, Rose, Rosemary Antoine, um, also by Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, and I want to also specially recognize the Rapporteur for the Rights of Persons Deprived of Liberty, who has also very closely followed and monitored the situation at Guantanamo Bay, Commissioner Rodrigo Escobar Hill. Uh, the Commission has, in the last six months, um, taken a number of actions in relation to Guantanamo Bay. We issued a press release after the hearing in March of this year in which the Commission received important information from petitioners about a widespread hunger strike at Guantanamo Bay. In the summer of this year, we amplified the existing precautionary measures uh, for the benefit of persons detained and asked the government of the United States to close the facility. Uh, we held an expert meeting a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C. to better understand the situation and the specific legal status of persons held at Guantanamo Bay and to better understand um, the operation of military commissions. Uh, we have requested a meeting uh, with the Secretary of State for the United States and held a meeting with the Special Envoy, um, Mr. Cliff Sloan, as well. Um, we have also reiterated our request to visit the facility. Um, we want to warmly welcome those who are in attendance, um, providing information to us, and we especially wish to warmly welcome Juan Mendez, former president of the Inter-American Commission, now the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, we have worked closely together in relation to monitoring the issue at Guantanamo Bay, and we welcome you. We also <coughs> welcome the representatives from the Center for Constitutional Rights, and also Sahil, who will also provide us with information today, and they'll introduce themselves to you. Um, as always, we're grateful to have the presence of the representatives of the United States of America um, and the delegation which is led by Deputy Permanent Representative Lawrence Gombinga, Gombina and uh, his team who are here today. Um, we look forward to the opportunity to hear from both those who are providing information and the response of the state in better understanding the situation at Guantanamo Bay today. Um, can I invite um, those providing us with information uh, to introduce yourselves and to share with us over the next 20 minutes or so? Good morning. Thank you. We thank the Honorable Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for convening this essential hearing on the urgent and ongoing situation of the men detained in Guantanamo. We also thank the distinguished representatives of the state for their attendance and participation. My name is Charles Abbott from the Center for Justice and International Law, SEHIL, and I am joined today by Francisco Quintana, also of SEHIL, Omar Farah of the Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR, Wells Dixon, also of CCR, and uh, we also have the honor of being joined by the United States Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez, who has appeared today at the Commission's request to provide independent expert testimony as part of his UN mandate. Sahil and CCR thank this Honorable Commission for being the first international human rights body to hear uh, a petition about Guantanamo, starting when we first uh, requested precautionary measures together with CCR in 2002. Uh, the actions of the Commission, uh, these principled positions and protection of the men detained in Guantanamo have included collective precautionary measures for all the men detained there, which as the Commissioner mentioned were recently amplified. Uh, two resolutions in 2006 and 2011 calling for the closure of Guantanamo, 
uh, seven press releases uh, independent of hearings, ten hearings including this one, and countless requests for on-site visits, which as we will mention later have not yet been honored by the state. In granting petitioners requests to vigorously use its faculties, this commission has made an important impact in bringing needed attention to the ongoing and serious human rights violations taking place in Guantanamo. As the commissioners mentioned, in the months that have followed our March thematic hearing on the situation of human rights in Guantanamo, the situation has reached crisis levels as a mass hunger strike was met with retaliatory state practices, including an official state practice of force feeding detainees via painful nasogastric intubation, disproportionate use of force, including firing non-lethal shots at detainees on hunger strike, seizure of detainees' properties, including legal mail and correspondence with family members, the use of 22-hour solitary confinement as a retaliatory measure, and a punitive general search policy to discourage detainees from meeting with counsel or speaking to members of their family. Acting on the information we submitted, this honorable commission has taken decisive action in the past months, including issuing a joint declaration on May 1st, together with the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, the UN Special Rapporteur on Health, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and amplifying the scope of the precautionary measures, as well as holding a meeting of experts at the beginning of this month to gather information on the situation. In fact, this Honorable Commission has been <clears throat> at the forefront of a significant group of international observers who provided needed visibility to the human rights violations unfolding there, and which ultimately resulted in the President of the United States Government publicly pledging to take steps to close Guantanamo on May 23rd of this year, the first such public statement by the state in years. The importance of this principled action by the Inter-American Commission cannot be overstated. Since then, the state has named new special envoys for the closure of Guantanamo in the Department of State, Clifford Sloan, and in the Department of Defense, uh, Paul M. Lewis, who will begin his mandate on November 1st. And it has only transferred two detainees out of Guantanamo, but has uh, made this first step. Nonetheless, justice delayed is justice denied. And at the government's current rate of transfers, Guantanamo will still remain open 40 years from now. Just as prior promises by the United States government rang hollow, and just as the state's own self-imposed 2010 deadline for closing Guantanamo came and went, there is currently no guarantee that the state will fully comply with its obligation to take concrete, decisive steps towards closing the detention center at Guantanamo Naval Base once and for all. No guarantee, that is, except for this commission's vital, ongoing attention to the situation of the 164 men who remain arbitrarily and indefinitely detained at Guantanamo, including 84 men already approved for release or transfer by the government itself. For these men, the Inter-American Commission is their last and best hope. As my colleague Omar Farah of CCR will mention, there is currently no end in sight to the suffering uh, for the overwhelming number of Yemeni detainees indefinitely detained at Guantanamo due solely to their nationality. And despite the executive's recent statement that the official nationality-based moratorium of Yemeni transfers will come to an end, not a single Yemeni detainee has been transferred yet. Finally, we will have the distinct honor of receiving independent expert testimony from the United, Nates, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez, who, like the commissioners, has insisted on reiterated occasions that the state must allow the Commission and the UN Human Rights Council mechanisms and special rapporteurs to conduct on-site visits to the Guantanamo Detention Center and meet freely and privately with the men detained there. The reason for this is simple. If they were to accept preconditions or limitations to their on-site visits to the United States, other countries around the world would follow suit in hiding away their most problematic detention sites, which would fundamentally undermine the purpose of international human rights bodies' role as independent and, automatic find and, and uh, autonomous fact-finders. The Commission insists on holding the U.S. to the same standard as all other countries. The Commission's on-site visits have changed the course of history on numerous occasions, as was the case in its famous 1979 visit to Argentina, its visits in the 1980s to uh, Central American countries during the turmoil of that decade, to Haiti, to Nicaragua, to Colombia, to Chile. Accordingly, the petitioners urge the state to publicly tell the commissioners and the special rapporteur during today's hearing, will the state allow them to conduct an on-site visit to the detention center in Guantanamo Bay without limitations or preconditions as required by their mandates? We also call on the state to explain, as the Commission has requested on reiterated occasions, what new specific concrete steps is the state taking toward closing the detention center at the Guantanamo Naval Base once and for all. 
In addition to reiterating its previous request for an on-site visit and reiterating its earlier recommendations and questions, Sahil and CCR additionally request that this Honorable Commission issue a thematic report on the situation of human rights of persons detained in the Guantanamo Naval Base. I now cede my time to Mr. Farah. Good morning. My name is Omar Farah. It's a pleasure to be back before the Commission. Um, as, as the Commissioners are aware, I represent several of the men currently detained at Guantanamo, and I have since 2008. I travel to the prison regularly. I came back most recently on October 21st. Uh, I want to second the, the comments of my, my colleague, Mr. Abbott. The Commission's contributions on this question have been indispensable, uh, particularly during the, the, the ongoing um, the 2013 mass hunger strike. The Commissioner's ability to return international attention to Guantanamo was uh, invaluable, and on behalf of my clients, I, I, I have to thank the Commission for its, its work. Just by way of introduction, two issues that we've uh, largely briefed the Commission in our written submissions that I just want to touch on. The first is the, the hunger strike. The Commissioner should be clear that the hunger strike continues. There, there are roughly 14 men uh, who continue to refuse food from the Department of Defense. Uh, as, as best I know, all of them, or almost all of them, are being force-fed. This includes my own client, Tarek Baoda. I won't recount his story too much. I think the Commissioner is well aware of it at this point, but he's one of the longest uh, hunger strikers at Guantanamo. Since February 2007, he has been force-fed through his nose on a daily basis. I'm sure that the Commissioners will have more questions for the State about the legality and the ethics of this practice, but I hope that increasingly a, a medical line of inquiry is open to the State. I wonder whether or not the State has assessed whether or not it's medically viable to force feed a man liquid dietary supplements through his nose in perpetuity. I'm not a physician, I can't answer that question, but my own interactions with Mr. Bauda suggest that he cannot endure that. The physical degradation of his body is alarming. The other issue I just want to touch on briefly is the genital search policy, which from my most recent visit remains the primary impediment to the prisoners exercising their constitutional right to leave their cells to meet uh, me and the other attorneys who visit them. Uh, in addition, because the policy applies to any external move, should a prisoner want to leave his cell for purposes of accepting a family phone call uh, with, with, for, with his loved ones, he hazards the exact same risk of having uh, a humiliating genital search policy. This is something that affects my own relationship with my clients. The same individual I just mentioned, Mr. Tarek Baoda, I have not seen or spoken to directly since the announcement of this policy. Um, when the hunger strike was at its height. There are a number of issues uh, that the Commission must turn its attention to, but above all of these, and I think uh, the, the, the worst of these abuses is the fact that no one is leaving Guantanamo, certainly not at a pace that should satisfy this Commission. Um, my colleague again touched on this briefly, but since the President's highly publicized speech in May, two prisoners were repatriated to, to Algeria. At that pace, it would be roughly 2030 before the last of the cleared prisoners leaves Guantanamo, to say nothing of the men slated for indefinite detention or trial by military commission. That means that Guantanamo, this issue that we've been discussing for more than a decade at this point, will be with us for a very long time to come indeed. There's one way, however, in the, <clears throat> that those two transfers were significant, and I, and I hope the commissioners will draw attention to this. For a long time, CCR and Sahil and others have argued that the legislative framework the domestic legislative framework grants the President the latitude to transfer prisoners if there was the political will to do so. I think that question now is decisively answered in the affirmative. If the President could transfer these men in August 2013, he could have done so in August of 2012 and before. The question remains, why not more transfers? Why not faster? How long will we wait? I want to be uh, clear. The, the most pressing issue, besides the appallingly slow rate of transfers is Yemen. There will be no final resolution to the Guantanamo problem until the state changes, dramatically changes, its approach to the Yemeni detainees. Ninety of the 164 men remaining at Guantanamo are Yemeni. Fifty-six of the 84 cleared prisoners are of Yemeni descent. That means fully one-third of the entire prison population are men from Yemen. And yet, no Yemeni has left the prison alive since 2010. This is the direct result of the President instituting a moratorium on transfers to Yemen in the wake of the failed underwear bomber attack. Uh, the responsibility for this policy rests with him. He bears the unfortunate distinction of formalizing and institutionalizing a policy of discrimination on the basis of national origin 
in violation of some of the most basic and cherished international human rights law norms, and it's an issue that's squarely within the mandate of this commission to address. The, the moratorium, as the, as the commission is aware, the, the president has declared that it's been lifted. The, the challenge, of course, is that the moratorium was lifted in precisely the same way that it was imposed. The president simply stated it, and there's been no evidence yet that the state has taken concrete steps to actually implement the, the lifting of the moratorium in a way that has appreciable benefit for any of the men detained at Guantanamo who are Yemeni, including any of my clients. I hope that the commission will ask the state where it is in its case-by-case -case review of the Yemeni detainees who are detained at Guantanamo. That's something the president promised five months ago. I represent Fahed Ghazi. I met with him several times during the last week. He's detained under the ISN 026. This is a man who was detained first at age 17. He'll be 30 in roughly five months. He was, this is a person who could be seamlessly and immediately reintegrated into his life, at, uh, his family life and home life back in, in Yemen. He was first in his high school class, won a scholarship to Sana'a University to study in the Faculty of Science. He has a daughter and a wife who live in the same family home that Fahid himself was, bor was born into with his mother and his brothers. Uh, this is someone who knows something about dashed hopes and disappointments. He was cleared for release in 2007 by the Bush administration, was cleared again in 2009 by, the, by President Obama, and in each instance wrote lengthy dozens of letters that he's shown to me to his, his wife and his daughter asking them to prepare for his homecoming, that the day they had been waiting for had finally arrived. In fact, he made formal requests to the prison administration to make sure that his books were transported with him so that when he got home, he could continue his self-education and be in a position to provide for his family. Where is Fahad Ghazi's case in the state's state case-by-case -case review of the Yemenis? How far along in that process is it? In fact, the, the better question is, how long does it take the state to review the case of a man who it's already determined has been cleared for release on two separate occasions. More broadly, how long does it take the United States government to effect the transfer of Fahad Ghazi to Yemen with all of its resources and all of its influence? If not Fahad Ghazi, any of the other Yemenis. I hope the state will take up these questions with this, with, I hope the commissioners will take up these questions with the state directly, without definitive, without decisive answers, in the affirmative about what the state is doing to resolve this issue, I fear that there is no reason to believe that the state has heard the commissioner's admonition from May that it abandoned what has been a formal and institutionalized policy of discrimination on the basis of national origin against the Yemenis, and there will ultimately be no final solution to the disgrace of Guantanamo. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to, to speak to you in my capacity as a special rapporteur on torture for under the aegis of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. Um, I wish to state at the outset that my presence here uh, cannot be interpreted in any express or implied way to waive any of the immunities that the United Nations uh, holds under the 1946 agreement on uh, privileges and immunities of the United Nations. <clears throat> the situation of detainees in Guantanamo Bay, including alleged practices of torture, indefinite detention, use of solitary confinement, lack of access to appropriate legal recourses, and lack of accountability for actions by state actors, as well as issues such as a recent hunger strike and forced feedings, is extremely relevant to my mandate and I have had the opportunity to express my concerns over it on several occasions, both in bilateral representations to the United States government and publicly. <clears throat> During the past decade in particular, there has been a rise in the use of torture or ill treatment around the world and an increase in the practice of indefinite detention, largely due to the extraction of intelligence information in the context of the global fight against terrorism and the deliberate undermining of the absolute prohibition of torture. In this context, I have reiterated in various, on various occasions the need to adopt concrete measures. First, to end the indefinite detention of prisoners. Uh, second, to provide for their release or prosecution in accordance with due process and the principles and standards of international human rights law. 
Third, to allow for independent monitoring by international human rights bodies. And fourth, to close the detention center at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. In particular, I have reiterated my interest in visiting Guantanamo in order to assess the situation directly in accordance with the methods of work of my mandate. Regrettably, the United States government, although agreeing to my visit, has not yet agreed to allow me to conduct it under conditions that I can accept, namely with the possibility of visiting any and every part of the facility and being able to interview without supervision any detainee of my choosing. These limitations were also imposed on my predecessor and three other mandate holders who were granted access to the facilities by the previous administration in 2004, but had to refuse. I would like to stress, however, that the government has invited me to Guantanamo to observe hearings before the military commissions, and I am planning to come uh, in the upcoming months uh, to observe hearings that are related to issues covered by my mandate, namely the admissibility or exclusion of evidence uh, alleged to be obtained under torture. My upcoming visit to observe hearings about the exclusion of evidence should not be understood as a substitute for my insistence to visit the detention facility under the well-established terms adopted by the Human Rights Council uh, for the visits uh, to, uh, to detention facilities worldwide. In the particular situation of indefinite detention, the uncertainty regarding the length of time increases the risk of serious mental pain and suffering to the inmate that may constitute cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, and in some cases may even constitute torture. My mandate has publicly declared on various occasions, and most recently on 1 May 2013, that the indefinite detention of individuals in Guantanamo, most of whom have not been charged, goes far beyond a minimally reasonable period of time and causes a state of suffering, stress, fear and anxiety, which in itself constitutes a form of cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. The continuing and indefinite detention of individuals without the right to due process is arbitrary and constitutes a clear violation of international law. This situation is particularly clear with respect to those prisoners who have been cleared for transfer by the government. The indefinite detention of, <coughs> of detainees is sanctioned by Executive Order 13,567, titled, quote, Periodic Review of Individuals Detained at Guantanamo Bay Naval Station Pursuant to the Authorization for Use of Military Force, end quote. This uh, uh, executive order installed a periodic review system of Guantanamo detainees that makes it effectively possible for the U.S. government to keep inmates detained indefinitely by executive decision if it is determined that they pose a significant threat to the security of the United States. The U.S. government has an obligation under international human rights law to ensure that individuals deprived of their liberty can have the lawfulness of the detention reviewed before a court. Those Guantanamo detainees who are accused of crimes need to be tried in civilian courts. The military commissions, even after legislative amendments were introduced to the military commissions, in the Military Commissions Act of 2009, simply maintain a substandard system of justice and do not meet international fair trial standards. Detention until the end of hostilities is, of course, permissible under the law of armed conflict. But all detentions that take place away from the field of battle should be covered by international law of human rights, which prohibits prolonged arbitrary detention even if they are carried out under rhetorical war on terror. In this context, I would like to make reference to a joint report by my predecessor, Manfred Novak, by the chair of, working, of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and the Special Rapporteurs on Religious Freedom and the Right to Health, uh, a report from 2006 on the situation of detainees at Guantanamo Bay, which in its paragraph 23 states that the indefinite detention of prisoners of war and civilian internees for purposes of continued interrogation is inconsistent with the provisions of the Geneva Conventions. <clears throat> Additionally, I have called upon the government of the United States to respect and guarantee the life, health and personal integrity of detainees at Guantanamo, particularly in the context of the hunger strike that began in the early spring of 2013 and that, according to information received, is still ongoing, although at a lesser scale. My mandate has received information about the painful and humiliating procedure used for force feeding. 
which involves detainees being strapped to a chair while a feeding tube is roughly inserted through the nose and into the stomach and roughly extracted. This painful procedure lasts between 30 and 120 minutes, and in addition, detainees reportedly remain strapped to the chair for several hours afterwards in an attempt to prevent them from regurgitating the food. According to the World Medical Assembly's declaration of Malta in cases involving people on hunger strike, the duty of medical personnel to act ethically and the principle of respect for individuals' autonomy must be respected. Under these principles, it is unjustifiable to engage in force feeding of individuals contrary to their informed and voluntary refusal of such a measure. Moreover, it is not acceptable to use threats of force feeding or other types of physical or psychological coercion against individuals who have voluntarily decided to go on a hunger strike. This is not to say, however, that the prison authorities should just let inmates starve to death. Rather, authorities have a duty to look for other solutions to the crisis created by the hunger strike, including good faith dialogue with the inmates about their grievances. I consider the practice of indefinite detention and other conditions applied to detainees in Guantanamo, such as solitary confinement, as well as the use of force feeding, as forms of ill treatment that in some cases can amount to torture. The international law prohibition and its absolute nature are equally applicable to torture and to all forms of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. States cannot limit the application of this prohibition under the domestic law for reasons of public emergencies, anti-terrorism measures, or in the context of armed conflict. While I welcome President Obama's announcement on 23 May 2013 that he was placing a high priority on closing Guantanamo during his second term in office, as well as his call on Congress to lift restrictions on transferring detainees to other countries, I remain concerned for the situation of detainees and the fact that human rights violations continue to take place. I therefore continue to urge the United States to first adopt all legislative, administrative, judicial, and any other types of measures necessary to prosecute with full respect for the, for the right to due process, the individuals being held at Guantanamo Naval Base or where appropriate to provide for their immediate release or transfer to a third country in accordance with international law. Second, to expedite the process of release and transfer of those detainees who have been certified for release by the government itself. Third, to conduct a serious, independent, and impartial investigation into the acts of force feeding of inmates on hunger strike and the alleged violence being used in those procedures. Fourth, <laughs> to allow the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the United Nations Human Rights Council mechanisms, such as the Working Group and the UN Special Rapporteurs, to conduct monitoring visits to Guantanamo under con conditions in which they can freely move about the installations and meet privately with the prisoners and without witness or witnesses or surveillance. And finally, to take concrete, de decisive steps toward closing Guantanamo once and for all. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Can I invite the state and deputy permanent representative Gombeina to, to introduce your team? You have about 20 to 23 minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I am joined here today by members of our staff at the State Department, Ms. Rachel Owen, Ms. Margaret Pickering, and Mr. Andrew Stevenson. Distinguished Commissioners, Petitioners, and Secretary colleagues, my name is Lawrence Jacob Beener. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. It is a pleasure to be here today. I would like to begin by reaffirming that the United States takes the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its role in the OAS very seriously and is committed to addressing with you human rights issues in the hemisphere, including in the United States. We have worked steadfastly in recent years to increase our engagement with the Commission on important human rights issues facing our country. We have actively participated in the Commission's meetings, hearings, and expert consultations. We are dedicated to the process and make every effort to ensure the appropriate level of participation to provide the Commission with the opportunity to engage with a full array of policymakers and decision makers in the U.S. government. We take pride in the Commission's role in our region. We are open to engagement and welcome the hearings today on particular topics of concerns to NGOs, civil society, and the public. 
However, events in the last month have prevented the United States from preparing sufficiently in order to engage as fully as we would like for today's hearing. Consistent with the Commission's rules providing for no less than 30 days notice of hearings, the United States received four notices for hearings on the evening of Friday, September 27, each of which included voluminous statements and submissions by interested private persons. Just a few days later, on October 1, most of the U.S. federal government was shut down and did not reopen until October 17. This extraordinary event, something that has not happened in the United States for 17 years and never during the period immediately before a commission session, prevented the United States from undertaking full and adequate preparations for the hearings today. With the government closed and most of its employees furloughed, we lost the, the, the ascent time essential to engage our interagency colleagues and prepare for these hearings. Many of the specific government agencies with expertise in the matters to be raised in the hearings did not have staff on the job to consider the Commission's communications and assist in preparations. It was for these reasons that on October 8th and again on October 18th, the United States sent separate letters to the Commission requesting a postponement of all U.S. hearings and working meetings until the February 2014 sessions. Please be aware that we made these requests after much consultation and with the understanding that petitioners, NGOs, and the public deserve robust participation from the United States, something we knew would not be possible with such a limited amount of time. The experts from throughout our government who returned to work after more than two weeks of furlough were not able at this late stage to identify witnesses, prepare testimony, gather documentation, and do the work necessary to fully respond to the issues to be raised. Given the sensitive and important nature of the matters before us today, and because the United States takes its engagement with the Commission seriously, we typically take an entire 30-day period for my government to prepare fully researched and coordinated responses. The bottom line is that unfortunately today we are not in a position to address the issues of concern raised by the Commission on this topic. Nonetheless, I would like to point out, as Madam Chair has stated, that the United States actively participated in an expert meeting on this issue on October 3. As we stated there, the United States strongly supports the work of the Commission, and we have submitted more than 10 separate filings regarding our Guantanamo detention operations. We also have engaged in many hearings before the Commission on matters regarding Guantanamo, including at its last period of sessions held in March. As the President has stated, we are committed to closing Guantanamo. On May 23rd, as has been referred to, President Obama announced several measures to achieve this objective. First, an effort to repeal current legislative restrictions that hamper or prohibit actions to implement transfers to other countries or to the United States for trial and detention. Second, the appointment of a Department of State Special Envoy now in place and a Department of Defense Special Envoy whose appointment has been announced to pursue the transfer of detainees to the greatest extent possible under current legislative restrictions on transfers. Third, the lifting of the moratorium on detainee transfers to Yemen to allow for a case-by-case -case review of those individuals who are designated for transfer. And fourth, the identification of a U.S.-based site at which to conduct military commissions proceedings. In addition, the periodic review process has commenced by which an interagency board assesses whether continued law of war detention of certain detainees is necessary to protect against a continuing significant threat to the United States. The United States will undertake vigorous efforts to transfer any additional detainees approved for transfer via this process. But again today, uh, unfortunately, we are here just to carefully listen to what these representatives and witnesses have to say and to take any questions or comments from the Commission. Since we will not be in a position to provide responses today, we propose to follow up in writing in the next 30 days 
to any additional questions or concerns of the Commission. We would welcome an opportunity to appear and discuss these issues at a future hearing before the Commission. We would like to thank you for raising these issues and assure you of our follow-up in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Permanent Representative. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, we are joined by the Executive Secretary, Emilio Alvarez y Casa, and the Deputy Executive Secretary, Elizabeth Abbey Merced. Uh, as the Deputy Permanent Representative noted, the Commission was asked to postpone this and other hearings involved in the United States. Um, the Commission had due and careful regard to the request. Um, the Commission took the position that there was a public importance to the issue. Um, it consulted with those who wished to participate in the hearings, and it also took regard of the fact that the state would have an opportunity, which we're grateful that it will avail itself of to respond. And we also wish to indicate to the state that it also has the opportunity to request a hearing if it wishes to raise um, its views and it res its responses with the Commission on another occasion. Um, but we welcome the opportunity to, to hear in more detail in response to the many um, questions which have been raised and which will be raised by the Commissioners. I wish to now turn to my fellow Commissioners who will have comments um, and questions and to begin with Commissioner Rodrigo Escobar Hill who has helped to lead the Commission's initiatives in response to Guantanamo Bay. He has responsibility for issues relating to persons deprived of liberty. I would like to begin by thanking the valuable information submitted by the Special Rapporteur at the UN on Torture, Mr. Juan Mendez. And I would also like to thank you for the information submitted to us by the petitioner organizations that are part of this hearing. The first thing that I must say is that I think I find the state's position totally unwarranted or unjustified when they pointed out that you they are not giving us information on the different topics raised here as a result of the administrative difficulties that they currently faced within the U.S. government. I think it is unjustified because the Guantanamo Bay issue is not new. It is not something that came up over the past two or three months. Rather, it is a truly structural problem that has been happening for, the, for over 11 years and on which the U.S. government is fully aware of which the U.S. government is fully aware and they have had ample opportunity to address the different issues raised regarding the operation of this detention center. Therefore, you are perfectly able to provide us with information on this regard regardless of the government shutdown that took place earlier this month. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Rapporteurship on the pre Persons Deprived of Liberty perceives that the situation of the detainees in Guantanamo as a major concern. The information that we have is that it is a generalized and systematic violation of these people's human rights. We are aware of torture, cruel and degrading treatment, and when the UN monitoring agencies requested authorization for visits to this detention center and requested that we were 
allowed to talk openly with detainees, authorization was not given to these monitoring agencies. And this is a true signal of lack of transparency. And when there is lack of transparency in the way a detention center is managed, all kinds of abuses may take place. Therefore, one of the topics that we would like to inquire the U.S. government about, and if you are not able to give us your answer today, please do so at a later time, is when you will authorize a visit to the detention center by the um, commission or other monitoring organization. Another big concern is, a huge concern, is the detainees' hunger strike. A hunger strike is a legitimate protest protest method and it should have sparked some interest in the US government for them to heed the the request by the detainees so i would like to know what kind of action has been taken to address the request by these people that are participating in hunger strikes. There are also reports of force feeding, which is not only in violation of ethical codes, but also the autonomy of the detainees. And the most serious things is that it involves inhumane and cruel treatment because degrading methods are used in order to feed these people. So we would also like to know what kind of investigation has taken place in this regard. Now, in terms of transfers of detainees have, uh, that have already been approved by the government, we would like to have information as to what kind of hurdles or barriers you're facing in order to carry out these transfers and when they will actually take place. I have various concerns, but I would like to conclude by saying that the Commission has ordered as a precautionary measure to close the facility, the facility that is operating within the Guantanamo base. The U.S. government says that they will close this detention center. So. We would like the U.S. government to specify what concrete steps have been taken in order to actually close the center and when this closure will take place. Thank you very much. I also welcome the petitioners and the representatives from the state and especially the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture uh, and former president of this commission, uh, Mr. Juan Mendez. I would like to stress the fact that this is uh, really something that the commission, the situation in the Guantanamo Bay base has been monitoring for over a decade and it is really indispensable for the U.S. government to take actions in this regard. The government itself has committed in this regard and when it did so at the first time, the Commission uh, did a public statement welcoming that decision on the part of the U.S. government. However, years uh, have passed and no uh, concrete action have been taken to close the Guantanamo Bay base. In particular, is, uh, it uh, worries me the fact that the U.S. Uh, government does not allow international bodies such as the Commission or the uh, U.N. bodies uh, to visit the Guantanamo Bay base uh, with uh, for the full powers to conduct an appropriate visit. Um, the U.S. government is, uh, is well aware that uh, these kind of conditions cannot be uh, accepted by international bodies. In my capacity of uh, rapporteur on migrants at the Commission, I remember during the prior administration at first in 2008, 
uh, it was uh, established as a condition that I would not be allowed to freely interview migrants uh, in detention, and the Commission did not accept the visit under those terms. And it was only in 2009 that we were able to conduct the visit because uh, the, the, the whole uh, powers of the commissions uh, would be respected at the visit. And the same is true for the Guantanamo Bay based. Um, it is indispensable for international advice, such as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, to be able to visit all the, 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 the places at the centers of detention and freely interview people there. This has been a rule applied by the Commission and by international human rights bodies for decades, it, and it's really um, a key aspect for its uh, credibility. I would like to hear from the U.S. government why are the reasons not to allow the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to conduct a visit under these uh, terms uh, that are part of the rules of procedures of the Commission for many years? Um, I think it would be very important to, to take that uh, step. And, uh, and more generally, I would like to stress the fact that this is not simply uh, a statement that the Commission uh, is doing today, expressing its worries about the situation at the Guantanamo Bay base, but it's rather a follow-up on precautionary measures that uh, were at first adopted more, than a, more than a decade ago. The Commission is very concerned about the fact that the U.S. government, despite public commitment, has not been moving uh, forward in an adequate manner to fulfill uh, this uh, precautionary measure issued by the Commission. Thank you. Good morning. I do not have additional questions apart from what my colleagues have raised and what the petitioners have raised, but I do need answers. And I would also like to express my concern at this continuing what was called a crisis. And I do think instead of seeing improvement, we have seen a worsening of conditions. I think it's ironically worse given that there has been an announcement that Guantanamo Bay will be closed, which to me is some sort of acknowledgement that it needs to be closed. So it, it continues, the longer it endures, the, the worse, or, or, or there is a worse stain on the democracy and the human rights records, record of the United States, which we see as a leading um, country in terms of democracy and human rights. So I am also joining my commissioner colleagues to ask and to express concern at this continuing state of affairs, and in particular to ask about the roadmap that uh, we need to see, a roadmap, what is the clear, what are, what are the procedures, what is the plan in terms of closure. And it strikes me that had we had a clear roadmap in relation to solving the crisis at Guantanamo Bay, then the administrative um, hiccup Perhaps it's more than a hiccup. But the administrative problem that arose recently would not have um, made this uh, hearing such a, um, an obstacle in terms of giving answers, because there would have been a clear response already, a clear policy. So, so it seems to me that there isn't. And I would like to see in the future that we are given these answers in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Um, to add um, a few observations and questions as contrary rapporteur, um, just to indicate that the Commission will be preparing a thematic report um, on the facility at Guantanamo Bay and the human rights um, situation there. Um, to also ask the state in the information which you'll provide us, to provide us specific information on the searches um, being conducted and the impact it um, has on the ability to have effective attorney-client um, relations and also the dignity of the persons um, who are being detained. Um, I also wanted to reiterate that the Commission has made a request to have a meeting with the Secretary of State. We have had an opportunity to speak with Special Envoy Sloan, but we still would welcome the opportunity to um, have direct discussions with the Secretary of State and to reiterate our interest in doing so. Um, I had a, a question about the role of the new Special Envoys, the two which have been appointed. Um, and to find out more specifically, 
about the quality and kind of coordination that exists between their work and the work of the Department of Justice in litigating um, cases involving detainees and whether there is a strong relationship between um, the interest of the government of the United States in closing the facility and the particular strategies it is adopting in litigating cases which involves detainees. And so we'd welcome further information on that. I wish to give a handful of minutes, maybe three minutes um, or so to the petitioners um, to offer questions, observations they have, um, and also to the, to the United States as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, I'm Wells Dixon from the Center for Constitutional Rights. I, I would like to respond to a couple of the points that were made. Um, first is the government's uh, contention that it, that it did not have adequate notice or opportunity to prepare for the hearing. Uh, I respectfully submit that that explanation for the, their inability to provide substantive answers strains credulity and is simply not persuasive. And I say that for two reasons. The first reason being that, that we are certainly informed and know that the, uh, the State Department officials responsible for the closure of Guantanamo Bay were not subject to the furlough uh, and were well aware of this hearing, uh, if only because uh, there were at least half a dozen people from the United States government who appeared at the thematic hearing on October 3rd, by which this, this thematic hearing was discussed. Um, uh, second is, uh, you know, as, as the Commission noted already, and as my, my colleague from Sahil explained in great detail, the issues that we're talking about are not new. You know, Mr. Mr. Farah, my colleague from, from CCR, addressed the, the issue of the Yemeni detainees. I respectfully submit that, that, that the problems and the ongoing violations of international human rights law are obvious with respect to uh, detainees from Yemen. I think you just have to look at the basic statistics to see uh, uh, that men are continuing to be detained at Guantanamo based on their citizenship. That is what passport they hold or what their, their national origin might be. And Guantanamo has become increasingly a prison for Yemenis, and this is not a new issue. It's something that the Commission has addressed. And, uh, you know, I, I respectfully submit that the, the government's uh, inability, a professed inability to address these issues today uh, is in, could be interpreted as a defiance of the Commission, just as the, the United States has refused to allow access uh, um, uh, for the Commission to the detainees, including detainees who I note for the record have requested to meet with the Commission. Uh, and I think ultimately underscores what, what Juan Mendez said in terms of uh, the impact that this has on the detainees. You know, uh, to, to delay and put over the, the substantive discussions about these issues is not just merely a procedural uh, inconvenience. It, it's substantive harm for the detainees. You know, the, the detainees uh, filed the request for precautionary measures in 2002. Uh, there have been a number of proceedings since then, and they, they've, they brought these actions because they wanted to challenge their ongoing indefinite detention. So, you know, every day that, that the United States delays responding to these issues is substantive harm. It's, it's more indefinite detention. That's the very harm that they filed this petition in order to address. So I, I think it underscores the, you know, again, the, the sort of the arbitrary aspect of, um, of, uh, of Guantanamo and the ongoing detention. Now, I'll just say one final thing with respect to Commissioner Robinson's question about coordination between the Department of Justice and, and the special envoys. Uh, you know, we don't represent the United States government, are not privy to uh, internal government uh, deliberations, but I can certainly say as a, as a representative of detainees who have challenged their detention in federal court in the United States and who have ongoing requests for release that have been presented to the federal court. It's certainly the position of the United States government that, uh, that they will continue to fight every uh, detainee who seeks to litigate and obtain an order of transfer from a, from a court. I mean, they, they, there is no coordination in that sense between the Department of Justice uh, and the, the policy goals uh, of the Obama administration, specifically the request to close uh, uh, Guantanamo. Thank you. Forgive me, Commissioner Robinson, I see time is short, but if I can just remind the Commission also with respect to the question for a roadmap, that was the point of departure for the May thematic hearing. That was the first question, if I recall correctly, from the Commission to the State. 
what is the plan for a final resolution to Guantanamo? So that the, your question, as, as valuable as it is, should not have caught the government by surprise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the United States would like to thank the commissioners as well as the petitioners, other witnesses today for the information and the questions. And as indicated in my statement, we'll be pleased to respond in writing within 30 days. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who's been here to participate in um, and attend in this hearing. Um, be assured the commission remains committed to following up in all the ways in which it has in the past and has committed in the future as well. Thank you very much.